Hi friends, welcome to another decisive ass handing episode of the Debate Police. Debate Police. The people with their arguments state their claims with such confidence. If or not, they know things has yet to be ascertained. All the people with their arguments say their claims with such confidence if or not they know things has yet to be ascertained police welcome back to debate police this episode is actually motivated by a comment by think about it i believe who said the gist of it was look we know evolution happens even if we can't explain how well, no, as a matter of fact, there's no reason to conclude it does happen, that gradual change over time to species occurs by any mechanism, if we can't explain what that mechanism is. So that's reality in terms of the argumentation. I'm functioning as a debate police officer here. I'm not defending my position. I'm critiquing these arguments, and I'm telling you which ones stand and which ones don't, which ones are sound, which ones are not. Have you seen this video before? No, I've never seen it before. She linked to it. <laughs> I check it out, or he. I don't know which it is. It's a he. He's got a beard. Before we even begin this video, this a simple but necessary clarification must be made. People very often confuse abiogenesis with evolution when they shouldn't. Abiogenesis is the study of how life first emerged from non living matter, and it's not discussed within this video. Evolution, on the other hand, is the study of biological change over time, and it is the star of this video. Now, with that said and out of the way, let's get on with the video. The evidence for evolution comes from every branch of science that remotely interacts with organisms. This includes, to name but a few, anatomy, biology, embryology, genetics, neurobiology, and paleontology, which in turn includes every subfield of these sciences, such as anthropology, biogeography, chronological dating, comparative anatomy, fossils, molecular biology, and the list goes on and on and on and on. The point being... Let's start right there. Just because evolution takes... It takes into its general framework, which is not not a theory, okay, it's definitely not a theory in any meaningful sense of the word, just because it takes into its general framework, which is all it is, a claim that this is where complexity of life came from, um, it takes elements from lots of different sciences. That doesn't comprise the case for evolution. Those other sciences are not necessarily supporting evolution. Most of those other sciences and those other scientists are not evolutionary scientists. Evolutionary scientists do take elements from those other sciences, but that doesn't render evolutionary science as somehow inhabiting the legitimacy of other sciences that it takes from. So, clarification number one, you're wrong number one, right off the bat, to cite that as significant. But I know that's not the only argument you're going to make, so let's continue. In here is that everything we objectively know about the natural world both supports and improves the theory of evolution by natural selection, whether we like it or not. This is nine proofs of evolution, why evolution is true. No, he just made a fatal mistake if he were going to argue this point. He said right off the bat that it's natural selection that causes evolution, okay? But um, what you'll see is actually it's not. For, for a lot of different reasons. Evolution through natural selection... Let's look at the news here. Well, anyway, let's continue. But the point is, he said selection, okay? So note this. What does he mean by selection? First of all, let me make a distinction that's very clear. It's important to make as well. There is negative selection. If you have a mutation that causes you to be non-viable as, as an individual within a species, you'll die. If you have a mutation that causes you to be non-viable reproductively within a species, that mutation will die out. This prevents decay within species, genetic decay. So um, there is a negative extinguishing quality of selection that's absolutely there that preserves the health of the genome for a given species, okay? And helps for one of the reasons why it prevents it from drifting too much. So let's listen to his proofs now. Now, to present all of the evidence for evolution would take eons and would bore even Darwin, Dawkins, and Jay Gould. And so if you're really interested in reviewing all of the overwhelming evidence for evolution, then this video isn't it. 
What it is, however, is just nine lines of evidence from several fields of study which by themselves alone make a very convincing case. So, where to begin? Well, the first two lines of evidence that I'm going to present both come from the comparative anatomy of whales to land mammals. We've long known that despite whales looking like fish, they're mammals, because just like mammals, and unlike fish, they give birth to live young, feed their young milk via their mammary glands, breathe through two lungs rather than gills, have skin and hair rather than skin and scales, and they're warm blood. Proof of evolution now this at all. alone strongly implies that they share a common ancestor with land mammals. But if what really you makes assume this evolution is begging the question, the okay, if we assume that different species come from similar ancestors, then you would logically conclude that these two come from a similar ancestor. But you could explain the similarities in the biology by saying they are two manifestations of a similar track of possible biological expression, or simply that they were designed to be that way, potentially. But I don't need to provide a counter-affirmation. I'm not saying I'm a fan of uh, uh, design, like intelligent design. I'm saying I don't buy this at all because it doesn't explain anything. No, he's just pointing out the things that would seem to imply, which it does. It does seem to imply that maybe there's there's an increased complexity and a divergence from these, uh, well, once one common species or something. Lots of things seem to imply that. It makes good intuitive sense to come up with evolution if you're Darwin. And you probably think, wow, I'm a genius. The only problem is, and you're not going to hear me say this very often, you have to pay attention to the empirics too. If the empirics don't verify, but instead falsify your claims, then you have to accept that. You can't just keep clinging to it and adjusting. This is very much like it was back in the olden days when the, the church thought the Earth was the center of the solar system and compelled all the astronomers to do work that supported that conclusion. <coughs> and so they started having, what well, you know, they said, well, everything's a perfect circle in the heavens. So they had to have perfect circles. Now, of course, in actuality, the orbits of things are ellipses. But the church wouldn't allow that. So they had increasingly complex concentric circles. Well, that's what's happened with evolution. And we have multiple competing ideas of how evolution actually occurs that are conflicting with each other. Uh, gradualism is uh, one theory that says evolution happens very, very slowly for 4 billion years. That's the only way we can explain it because the genetics don't work out otherwise. You know, then in the early 70s or whenever it was, a Japanese uh, evolutionary scientist pointed out that we have almost no positive mutations. How can we explain positive mutations affecting the genetic pool of, of a population when there aren't any that we can identify? Uh, and then they came up with a neutral theory, where it's not selection that's actually driving it, it's neutral genetic drift. Except the math doesn't work out on that. If there were genetic drift, then it would only apply to very tiny populations. And the thing, and the additional thing is there's a drift barrier where that doesn't it ceases to have any impact beyond a certain number of population. But beyond that, there's the issue of, um, regarding the neutral theory, where are they going with this? Uh, oh, uh, well, beyond that, I mean, there's simply the, the, the reality that, 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 that theory of evolution says, really, we can't explain things through selection. That was 50 years ago, almost. 40 years ago. And it still hasn't sort of seeped into the general population. Another thing that happened in the late 70s, I believe, was uh, punctuated equilibrium. So they had another problem with its evolutionary theory. Well, it takes 4 billion years for shit to evolve, right? But there were all these extinction events that reset shit back to zero, basically. So now we're left with humans evolving from multicellular organisms into fully complex human beings over the course of 66 million years, even though we haven't evolved at all in any meaningful sense on a physical level in the last thousand years, and only a thousand thousands is a million. So the question is, why did we stop evolving? And people go, oh, we're still evolving, it's happening very, very slowly. Not according to, to punctuated equilibrium, the species are in a state of stasis. The species aren't changing right now. They're just like a million years where things happen really fast. So which of those two competing theories of evolution is correct? Is it the gradualism one or the punctuated equilibrium? They're in direct contradiction to each other. They cannot both be true. Okay? Let's let them continue. It's the curious bone structure of their flippers. Within their flippers, whales have, just like the forelimbs of land mammals, finger, hand, wrist, and arm bones, which can be easily explained if these bones are repurposed forelimbs, but are remarkably hard to explain if they're not. As after all, these bones have very little in common with non-mammalian fins, and yet a great deal in common with the forelimbs of land mammals. Furthermore, and to invoke... So, 
The similarity between bone structures between the two animals is easy to explain if we accept your wrong explanation. That's not a good reason to accept it. The fact that we don't have an easy explanation for it is not a reason to accept your wrong explanation for it. Quick second line of evidence. Whales have strange bones that look like shriveled hip, thigh, and shin bones where land mammals have hind legs. And some of these bones, such as these from a bonehead whale, even have what appears to be a ball and socket joint. Further still, paleontologists have found numerous species within the fossil record that have unique similarities with whales, but also varying sizes of hind legs. Now once again, these bones make perfect sense if they're vestigial and or repurposed, but they're very peculiar if they're not. Talking of vestigial traits, and to present a third line of evidence, a Right, like I was saying, it makes good intuitive sense to jump to these conclusions, but that's not a proof of evolution as it says in your title. That's just a reason why you're wrong. A, a good reason to be wrong, maybe even. Like say, well, I had every reason to think that you know, evolution made sense. Okay, fine. That justifies your wrongness in some capacity. You're not a complete idiot for thinking this. But I'm just saying, that doesn't prove anything at all. A superb example can be found in all mammals, including you, and it's called the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Without getting too technical, this nerve runs from the brain to the voice box, which should be a distance of a few inches. But instead, it goes down into the chest, loops around the main artery, and then goes back up to the voice box, which in the case of the giraffe results in a 15-foot detour, a mistake that no engineer would ever make. However, in animals without a neck, such as fish, the most direct route for this nerve is indeed by navigating around the artery, and hence, if mammals evolved from fish-like ancestors, we can easily explain why this absurd design exists. But if, on the other hand, we want to insist that it was deliberately created this way by a designer, then, well, we certainly can't call this designer intelligent. Now, the fourth... False dichotomy, you're guilty of a fallacy. I don't need to provide a counter-affirmation in order to negate your point. You're not proving evolution. You, in that case, are saying this bad idea is... Uh, provides a better explanation than intelligent design. But there are myriad, infinite other possible explanations that we can't think of yet, right? There are other explanations we can think of. We could go back in time and look at Lamarckian, Lamarckian explanations and try to find a mechanism in there, which makes a lot more sense than Darwinian evolution. Now, if you're talking about Lamarckian evolution, then I would say, okay, well, let's, let's open this topic about Lamarckian evolution. Maybe Lamarckian evolution can explain something. But you're not talking about that, and I probably wouldn't end up negating Lamarckian as well. You're talking about Darwinian evolution, and you're actually talking about natural selection. And your point being, we can't explain commonalities without us emerging from a common ancestor. The fossil record also supports the notion that there'd be uh, evolution, because it appears to be branching, right? That's pretty convincing. That's the most convincing evidence of evolution, is that it would appear that as we go back in time, we get fewer and fewer species. So it would seem that they emerge from the fewer into the more. Again, a good reason to intuit a, a conclusion, but not proof of anything. And all the actual proof out there is on the other side of things. So that's why we have to abandon our intuition when it's not right. And certainly we shouldn't use the word proof so fast and loose. And the fifth lines of evidence that I'm going to present both come from DNA sequencing, which for those of you unaware, is the process of determining the precise order of nucleotides within a DNA molecule, which put simply means that we can compare the DNA of one organism to another, and in doing so, see exactly how closely related they are. Needless to say, by doing this, we have made many outstanding discoveries. But perhaps the most extraordinary, and what I offer as a fourth line of evidence, is that all living things are related, and that therefore, all living things share a common ancestor. Seriously, of the DNA that is comparable, you share 97... I cannot believe he made that leap of logic. The fact that all individuals of species are made of the same basic sets of genetic and chromosomal building blocks does not mean that we're all related, first of all. I mean, what do you mean by related there? Do you mean blood relative? Like, I'm not related to Kimberly, but we have the same genetics. Or do you mean species related? In which case, you're begging the question. You're assuming there's a relation between species that comes from increasing complexity over time. You're begging the question and assuming evolution again. And you call yourself rationality rules. You should be ashamed of yourself. 80% with a chimpanzee, 80% with a cow, 60% with a fruit fly, and 50% with a banana. Now, most of us have heard this fact before and treated it like it's just a bit of trivia, including myself, but it's far more than this. It's unimpeachable proof that all living things share a common ancestor. And considering that all living things don't look the same, it's overwhelming evidence for evolution. And the second line of evidence okay, from if DNA... You're, or, if you're going to make fucking bald-ass false statements like it's unimpeachable proof, unimpeachable proof, it's absolutely not. Like, um, if I get a bunch of, of paint, okay, and I paint a house, and I paint a dog, and I paint a cow, and I paint a whatever, 
and I use different colors in painting them all. You'll be like, look, it's undeniable that they're related to each other because the cow has is 60% the same colors as the house. And blah, 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 blah. Well, they're related to each other in the sense that they both are made out of paint. And so there's going to be some color similarities between different paintings because there's a finite number of colors or finite spectrum of colors. Similarly, with genetic building blocks, there's a finite number of them, and they get put together in different combinations in order to make different species. Now, are they put together by an intelligent designer? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they, there are um, combinations, right? And permutations, the various permutations and combinations of different things, and they produce different species. Those permutations and com combinations do. So, it's absolutely not unimpeachable proof of anything and the fact that you claim that means that you should be I mean people when you walk around the streets and people recognize you as rationality rules they should run up and mock you for your irrationality your fucking bullshit claims your fallacies your overwrought assumptions that you can draw conclusions you cannot draw from pieces of information you cannot draw those, those conclusions from you don't understand how argumentation works you don't understand how logic works and you're sitting here claiming to be some sort of smart guy this is all bullshit you can't substantiate any of it it's not proof and the fifth within this video is that the closest living relative to cetaceans which is a class that includes whales is the hippopotamus a land mammal that just so happens to share many very rare commonalities with cetaceans for example both mammals are nearly hairless do not have sweat glands have remarkably thick bones are encased in dense fat have multi-chambered stomachs give birth to their young underwater feed their young underwater and communicate with the kin underwater now all of these similarities once again make perfect sense do you know what else they both do they both give birth only to individuals of their own species isn't that odd how Cetaceans and hippopotami always give birth to, respectively, cetaceans and hippopotami. They never give birth to something somewhere in between. Huh. And when you think about their populations, if there are 10,000 hippopotami, even if two hippopotami do give birth to a mutant that somehow is a better hippopotami, how in the world is that going to affect the genome as a whole? He's so vastly outnumbered. He'd have to be so vastly reproductively superior that he basically outcompetes every other hippopotamus, not in his vicinity, but in the entire species. So, if you really want to prove evolution, why don't you first say what the mechanism is? Oh, that's right, you did. Natural selection. Except, no scientist agrees with you. Yeah, it's true. Evolutionary scientists now have um, essentially done away with selection. Um, the death of selection in evolutionary science. Let's see. So you don't know what you're talking about at all, since you keep you don't even reference any real evolutionary science like I have by punctuated equilibrium. God damn it. Selection and evident in evolutionary science. I'm trying to talk and type it the same thing. <sighs> Can selection and evolution <sighs> argued against the ser several articles on the site argued against the theory of evolution. I, I don't know. I'm trying to find this one particular study that talked about a um, a, the, a species evolving without selection, and I can't find the study. That's not the point. It's out there. It was published within the last month or so. I saw the, the news on it. So um, let's see. Now I'm not the only person in the world who who has this position on evolution. There are other smart people out there. If you want to win the point about evolution, you first and foremost better come up with a cogent explanation for the mechanism. And if you can't come up with one, or you don't have one, or it runs afoul of existing evolutionary science, then um, the extravagant splendor of the animal kingdom can't be explained by natural selection alone. So how did it come to be? 
Haven't we all been told that Darwin's natural selection has already been shown to pl explain pretty much everything? Yes, we were all told that. It's bullshit. Forget about pretty flowers or cute puppies, but whole scholarly books have been written claiming that Darwin's theory explains mind law, blah, blah, blah. If the theory can explain much more complicated topics that involve even abstract thinking, why does it have trouble with simpler topics that don't? If it, for account, if it accounts for, say, the Magna Carta, why does it struggle with the colors of butterfly wings? It's not natural selection that accounts for beauty, but it's sexual selection that does the trick. Oh, really? But there's a big fly in the ointment. The existence of sex itself has stopped Darwinists for 150 years. It's still a mystery. What can the theory account for? Well, it says quite a bit, but it's not true. Let's see. Here's the problem for grand claims about evolution. Science can't tell if cholesterol is bad for modern humans. Who can be studied in great deal? Yet if that's too hard, how can science claim... These are not good good arguments, pretty gurui. But, um... Let's hear a simple test tell if scientists are exaggerating wildly. Let's call it the principle of comparative difficulty. If an easier task is too difficult to accomplish, then a harder one certainly is, too. If a high jumper can't clear a 10-foot bar, it's a sense you won't know why. It's a sense to know he won't clear 20. So what's wrong with this argument? This is a fun one, actually, to debate police. What's wrong with that argument is it assumes that the two things are being measured in the same units, right? Yes, it's true. It's harder to jump 20 feet than 10, and therefore if you can't do 10, you can't do 20. But very few things are single-unit tests like that. So it's it's a it's a neat argument, but it's, it's bullshit. Don't buy it. <laughs> Don't buy it for a second. Okay, uh, but there are plenty of good arguments against evolution besides that one. And let's continue letting this guy finish out so we can move on to uh, put him in jail where he belongs and move on. Share a common ancestor, as their DNA screams, let alone suggests. But if they didn't evolve from a common ancestor, then all of these similarities are one hell of a coincidence, and DNA is the greatest troll in history. No, it just means you don't have an explanation yet. The artificial selection of domestic dogs. It's no secret that most breeds of dog have the specific traits that they do because humans have deliberately or artificially selected which dogs get to reproduce, and in doing so, which traits are passed on to subsequent generations. For example, greyhounds have powerful legs, deep chests, flexible spines, and slim builds. Okay, so here's a beautiful thing that I, I love when people do this sort of stuff. They, they make really turnable arguments. Unfortunately for him, breeding things does prove that we can impact subsets of a species phenotypically and that we can impact them in terms of their general uh, domesticity, for example. But it also shows that evolution is bullshit. Because why? Chihuahuas can still breed with wolves. Meanwhile, an ass can't breed with a horse and make a viable offspring. A lion can't breed with a tiger and make a viable offspring. But a chihuahua can breed with a Great Dane and make a viable offspring. In fact, no matter how much breeding we've done, we've never, by a breeding, speciated any species. I think somebody sent me a, a, a study that purportedly proved it, that we had done it at least once. But they reproduced asexually. So, um... And I have, I'm skeptical of it. And even if we can do it, remember, that's maximizing forces that are necessarily much more minimal in nature. In other words, humans choosing every generation, pick these two, pick these two, pick these two, is creating an artificial founder's effect, as they call it in evolutionary science. Except, unlike what they say in evolutionary science, this repeated founder effect didn't create any species. Despite the fact that it was maximally faster, maximally more intense than any sort of selection that could naturally occur. So, sorry, you didn't prove evolution. You disproved it, idiot. God, I don't like this guy so much. I dislike him so much. Because humans have deliberately bred dogs with these attributes. The same is true of the tiny height of chihuahuas. They are the result of humans breeding smaller and smaller dogs. And the same is also true of the giant height of Great Danes. They are the result of humans breeding bigger and bigger dogs. It may not seem like it, but domestic dog breeds alone not only suggest evolution, they'll so demonstrate it. There are two species, now, just right? Explained, the selective pressure in the case of domestic dog breeds is artificial. It's humans deliberately selecting which dogs get to reproduce. But this raises the immediate question of what exactly selects which organisms get to reproduce in nature. And the answer is nature. To further explain this, and to give you a few fascinating examples, I'm going to have Thomas from Holy Kool-Aid jump in. Enjoy. This first example is a bit of a celebrity in the world of evolutionary biology, the peppered moth. During the Industrial Revolution, coal plants dumped out enough air pollution to kill the light-colored algae on trees and coat the foliage with soot. The light gray moths, which once blended in against the bark of the trees, were now exposed and were picked off by birds and other predators. But a small percent of the population had a rare genetic mutation that led to dark-colored wings. This beneficial mutation gave them a survival advantage, allowing them to camouflage in with their changing... Alright, I've talked about this example before on a number of occasions. 
Um, what he's saying is a rare genetic mutation of this species has black. It's all black instead of white. So he's talking about the, the Industrial Revolution. There were these moths that lived on trees. The trees were all white. And the moths were all white, so they blend in with the trees. And then after the Industrial Revolution and the coal started making the trees black, after a certain amount of time, the moths all were black. And then after a certain amount of time after that, they were all white again once the, the soot was off the trees. Okay, so what do we make of this? Well, we make of it in a species adapting to changes. There's, there's no disputing that that occurs. And then adapting back. And we see no speciation occurring. In other words, he's saying some of these individuals within the species mutated as jet black. So let's say that's true. How does he know that? Well, either there's a history of some individuals within the species coming out jet black before the trees changed to soot. Or he's just assuming it. It would seem more likely to me, if you were to explain it in a traditional evolutionary sense, that a mutation would occur where somebody, one of the moths is slightly more dark than the other, right? Slightly more dark. Not totally black. Totally camouflaged. Now, if they're not totally camouflaged, remember, the trees change from white to black right away. Over the course of a week. Um... And the moths changed, they lagged behind someone, right? So my question is, unless there were in existence already in the population jet black ones, then how is it possible that a few slightly darker moths out of a population of white that still stand out against the black trees, um, how is it possible that gives them enough of an advantage to, through reproduction, in a very short amount of time, change the whole species to black. Because most of the off-white ones are still going to get eaten. And some of the not, some of the pure white ones are not going to get eaten. And it's not going to be as, as razor sharp as, you know, all the, the darker ones survive and all the lighter ones don't. And the species is going to reproduce with a mixture. Of, the species members aren't going to say, I want to reproduce with the black one now because I can tell the trees are black. So it just doesn't make any sense. There's no disputing the fact that the organisms adapted to the situation, but there's some other mechanism to explain it. It's not sexual reproduction, that's for sure, and mutation, that's for sure, unless, like I said, those mutations existed as part of the population ahead of time, that there were regularly a small subset of that population that were black moths. In that case, negative sexual selection explains it, which I've already agreed with. You keep the genome of a species healthy by having negative, sexual se uh, negative selection. Things that aren't viable as living creatures are killed. The ones that remain will reproduce. The thing that caused the ones that get killed to get killed will be extinguished from the um, phenotype, at least, of these moths. But note, they return to white afterwards, which means it was still in their genetic code. Which means the species had within it already um, both expressions of color. And... Negative selection, ex negatively selected against all the one expression of color and positively selected for all the other expressions of color didn't change their species, didn't eliminate white from the genome because they returned to white afterwards. So that doesn't prove evolution. It disproves it. Again, if, if the moths had had to rely on sexual selection to... Um, to evolve as a species which is not evolving as a species, to adapt to the existing circumstances, they would all be dead. They'd be extinct, or they would have found some other way to evade the, the birds, or the bird just wouldn't have gotten them all, or something like that. So, you're wrong, 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 wrong. The environment. Before long, the majority of the peppered moth population were the darker variety. But in the 1950s, clean energy reform reversed this trend, causing the dark moths to be more vulnerable, leading to a resurgence in the lighter colored moths, who are still the dominant variety in the less polluted countryside. Now that genome sequencing has become available and affordable for scientists, researchers at the University of Liverpool have pinpointed the exact mutation that caused the color change. Another excellent example of evolution in action is the silent crickets of Hawaii. To attract a mate, male crickets on the island of Kauai would rub their wings together to create a chirping noise. Several years ago, a parasitic fly entered their ecosystem, honing in on the noisy crickets and laying larvae inside of them that would eat them from the inside out. A rare mutation on the X chromosome caused some crickets to develop without the ridges on their wings required to chirp. Natural selection did its thing, and within just 20 generations, 95% of the crickets on the island were silent. When the flies migrated to Oahu a few years later, the crickets there independently underwent the same life-saving evolutionary change via a different mutation. Now that's all fine and dandy creationists might argue, but those are all examples of microevolution, not macroevolution.
God damn it, how long has it been muted for? If these fuckers are serious, if these people are serious fucking people, I want them to answer my arguments, okay? Because look, there's a better explanation. What he's saying there is that these these things, what, what was he talking about a second ago? These these crickets, right? That these crickets were silent. And then now they're all noisy because of the, uh, they were noisy, but then they're silent because of the parasite. So what's a better explanation than microevolution, that the species evolved? A better explanation is that they contained the variation within the species already, and the ones who expressed variation A died, and the ones who expressed variation B didn't. Or that it was on a spectrum, and only the ones who were towards the bottom of that spectrum survived. But note, as with the moths, if the species can return the other direction, then the variation was within the species already. It's not something that they evolved to do. Why? Because if it were in fact a mutation and a separate gene that wasn't in the species already, then they would have lost that uh, that ability to be... What, they, they need to have the range in order for it to be selected against something. If they're all noisy, then the species of cricket is going to be gone. Okay? So, it, because... And it's not because, oh shoot, we're being invested, invaded by a parasite, so suddenly, coincidentally, fortunately, a mutation happens where there's a silent one, where before there were none. No, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Even if that were to occur, there'd be too few of a population of this mutation to impact the whole population as a whole. There's no reason to think that that mutation is going to be passed on. Maybe the dominant, maybe the recessive uh, of the noise making. And there's lots of other ways things can die. Unless you're saying you have multiple random, exactly the same mutations, in which case that doesn't make any sense. So again, you're providing examples that disprove instead of prove evolution. I would rub their wings together to create a chirping noise. Several years ago, a parasitic fly entered their ecosystem, honing in on the noisy crickets and laying larvae inside of them that would eat them. Oahu a few years later, the crickets there independently underwent the same life-saving evolutionary change via a different mutation. Now that's all fine and dandy creationists might argue, but those are all examples of micro By a different mutation. So... How do you know it's a different mutation? So, like, I, I want to hear the evidence on that. I could be convinced that it's a different mutation. That these two populations had um, different solutions to this problem in some way. That the genetic code that led to the silencing um, was a different route for each population. That would be indicative to me that we need to do a lot of explaining, you know, it's like there's a lot of explaining to do there. It's certainly, I mean, because you, you don't explain anything. I want to make that abundantly clear. There's no explanation of the mechanism by which this occurs. They're just claims that say, well, this appears to be supportive of this, of this mechanism, and we'll just ignore the only core question that matters, which, what the fuck is the mechanism? I provided in my explanation here, I say it's negative selection. So let's see what this is about macroevolution. Evolution, not macroevolution. Animals never change species or reproduce outside their kind, which brings us to ring species. For this, we'll take a look at the greenish warbler of the Himalayas, which biologists believe migrated south to north, branching east and west around mountains. As time passed, they evolved and adapted to their new environments. But by the time they met up north of the Himalayas, they were so different that they were no longer able to interbreed. Each bird reproduced with its southern neighbors all the way back around the loop, but they couldn't reproduce with each other. A textbook example of evolution in progress, if I've ever seen one. Thanks for those brilliant. Again, begging the question and assuming your mechanism to explain the thing that's occurred. The fact that you have species that are variations of the same species all up here, and then you have two, sp two species up here that are different species, that does not prove that there was evolution by it during the process of traveling around at all. Um, again, there's lots of things that would seem to indicate that there's related species, that maybe they came from a source species, you know, that these two kind of turtles came from proto-turtle. -tur Lots of reasons to think that that's intuitively a good notion. Lots of reasons. I'm not disputing that. Nobody's disputing that. But unless and until you can come up with an actual mechanism by which species change. Now, note what he said there at the, at the beginning of this. He conceded the point that defeats his point later. He's like, look, here's something obvious that defeats evolution. But, again, look at this thing that makes it really look like that, though. It really does look like that, so it must be that. That's all he does here. Listen to it. New ring species. For this, we'll take a look at the greenish warbler of the Himalayas, which biologists believe migrated... ...zone caused some crickets to develop... 
migrated to chirp. Natural selection did its thing, and within just 20 generations, 95% of crickets on the island were silent. When the flies migrated to Oahu a few years later, the crickets there independently underwent the same life-saving evolutionary change via a different mutation. Now, that's all fine and dandy creationists might argue, but those are all examples of microevolution, not macroevolution. Animals never change species or reproduce outside their kind. Which brings us to rings. According to creationists, again, it, it, these people don't get the fact. You guys are affirming that you have an explanation for where species come from. My negation does not require me to have a counter advocacy. I'm just saying you're wrong. I don't know what the right answer is. Two green species. For this, we'll take a look at the greenish warbler from the inside out. A rare mutation on the X chromosome caused some crickets to develop without the ridges on their wings required to chirp. Natural selection did its thing, and within just 20 generations, 95% of the crickets on the island were silent. When the flies migrated to Oahu a few years later, the crickets there independently underwent the same life-saving evolutionary change via a different mutation. Now that's all fine and dandy creationists might argue, but those are all examples of microevolution, not macroevolution. Animals never change species or reproduce outside their kind. Which brings us to ring okay. species. Animals never change species that reproduce outside their kind. Both those things are true. Individual animals never change species. And they don't reproduce out of their outside their species. And two members of a species always, as far as we can tell, always, always, always give birth to a member of the same species. So those moths, they didn't change species. They changed phenotype. Those crickets, they didn't change species, they changed expression or behavior. Um, the species adapted, it didn't evolve. And you answer this very cogent point, this incredibly powerful point that we already know two members of the same species always reproduce with each other and produce another member of that species, and it's the same species with the same gen genome. And that if, in fact, evolutionary science were right about, say, the neutral theory, genetic drift, and change over time, then the larger the number of individuals within a species, the more genetic diversity we see within a species. It follows naturally if what you're saying is true. But we don't see that math at all. In fact, species are very uniform in their genetic displays well beyond what anything we could use to justify evolution. I mean, if evolution were right, we'd see that. We don't. That falsifies it right there, but I understand that that's not going to be enough to falsify it for most people. But you, you don't prove anything here at all. And you cl the second word in the fucking title is proof. For this, we'll take a look at the greenish warbler of the Himalayas, which biologists believe migrated south to north, branching east Thanks for those brilliant examples, Thomas. As always, you're on form, sir. If you think those are brilliant now, examples, I that you're a retarded you individual. Knew who Thomas was before seeing this video, but for those of you who didn't, I implore you to check out his. I'm done with this fucker. Listen, rationality rules. This, this is this is your thumbnail, moron. This is what this is the face that your ideas are constantly making. Like you're trying to kiss somebody and convince them that they're sweet or something. When really, they're just... This poor guy. Just absolute fucking disaster. Poor guy. People think this guy is smart. Dumb people think he's smart. It is so fucking annoying to me. Well, you know what? What? Nobody's going to recognize him now because they're going to shave his head in jail. 165,000 subscribers for this fucking cretin. I mean, uh, I have more sound ideas when I am just waking up from surgery under the influence of serious heavy, heavy sedatives and I've just had a lobotomy, okay? I'm still going to have more understanding of anything in the entire world than you will ever have of anything ever. So, you know, go to jail. Go there where you belong. Stay in jail. Stop wasting everyone's time with your bullshit. And for God's sake, do not call yourself rationality rules. And for devil God's sake, don't say you offer proofs in that fucking garbage video of yours. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese. The big believe.
the people with their arguments State their claims with such confidence If or not they know things has yet to be ascertained All the people with their arguments State their claims with such confidence If or not they know things has yet to be ascertained Police.